I truly want to uh, express my gratitude for WINS. I just want to do a very like one 30 second introduction. Um, when I had first started my practice, um, I did not want to take any workman's compensation cases. And it happened so that one of my colleagues asked me to see somebody and I could not say no to him. And with that came a blessing that was in the form of WINS. I've never seen any attorney coming into your office, working as hard and as diligently and as passionately for the rights of an individual as was Vince. And so I, was, I thought that either I was seeing things and delusional, or it was really happening, and it really was happening. There was a, a person with a heart. My, my experience had been people who would not even return your calls, and here's somebody just sitting in your office and trying to make it easier for you and understand just for one client. One client meant a lot to him. And that moment was, that meant a lot to me too. And I said, there's something special going on here. And then as we developed our friendship in time, I recognized he was not in the business of doing what he does. He is in the passion of doing what he does. And I want to make sure you know that we're not sitting here understanding, uh, you know, that here he is, you know, another attorney. He's just a what I call a holistic attorney, you know, <laughs> you know, who, who really means it. And I'll just make one more comment, you know, is, uh, uh, so then I got introduced to his sons, and, and they both have now uh, obviously followed the lead of uh, their dad. And, and here's the beautiful thing, and this will be my promised last comment. He made a comment, uh, so I get a patient that Mike had seen, and he went in to see Mike to get on disability. And Mike tells him, I really think that you don't need not to be on disability. You need to get yourself well. And you hear the doctor, I want you to go and see. And after you have seen and done what you need to do, if you still have difficulties and illnesses, I'll work with you. Any attorney would have taken that case and just fought for that. He did not choose to do that. He told him that he has the ability to get back into being able to do well in life, and that's the beauty of their team, that they're just not out there trying to foster their business. They're out, they're out there to discern and then return people to health when they can or help them when they need that. So I'm very privileged that their, their team is here, and I just want to make that uh, my, my, my historical thing aware for our, our, our audience here. So thank you for being who you all are. Yeah, yeah. He's always so kind uh, and so inventive. I mean, it's the first time I've ever followed drums for my sp or speak. <laughs> and and if any of us go too long, I'll just use. Oh yeah, yeah, pretty cool. So. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, and uh, Softer has described uh, very kindly what we see as not only the business of law, but the profession of law. Uh, the gratification we get from helping someone through tortuous times uh, is what you get at the end of the day. So we get to share that and know that we too, like you, have made a difference. Uh, ours may be providing income to them uh, as opposed to you providing the necessary medical care and support for them. We're also joined by one of uh, Softer's colleagues, uh, Dr. Valentine, who I'll uh, speak to in a, later in the program. Uh, what we wanted to try to give you today was an overview of what goes on in proving a disability claim in the legal world and how you fit in that process uh, and, and a little bit inside of our heads 
of what we're trying to establish and what the rules are that we have to follow in establishing that claim. Uh, we consider ourselves advocates. We don't go through the motion. We are, when we're engaged by an individual, we feel it's our responsibility to, to scratch and claw and beat up whoever we have to to get a just result. And uh, this is many, many years of doing it. Uh, not only uh, am I fortunate to have my son Michael uh, in our firm, but equally fortunate to have Brian Bronson uh, with us. Uh, Brian brings that same passion uh, as well as an intellect to our process. So I'm going to turn this over to Brian to start uh, with that overview of the disability system, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Vince. And I, and I want to say that one of the most fulfilling things that we get to do as attorneys is um, we get to transition some of our clients, unfortunately not everybody, I think this is in the vein of the conference, from disability to not disability. Um, it doesn't happen as often as we would like, um, but it's a really happy moment for us when we can let a client move on with the rest of their life, whether through recovery, uh, whether through financial security. Um, it is just a fulfilling thing. So, um, you know, we're proud to be here, and I think that hopefully we educate you a little bit about um, disability, and hopefully you learn something today. Um, Disability benefits. So there's lots of different areas of the law where you can get disability benefits. Um, Social Security disability and SSI benefits are one of the, the main things that our firm does. Um, but we also do practice areas such as short-term disability and long-term disability where if you work for an employer, um, you might have a group policy which covers you. If you're a doctor, you might have a policy which covers you in the event that you can't do your specialty anymore. Um, and these are important policies because they protect your livelihood. They protect your skill set so that if you can't use your skill set anymore and have to either retrain or have to move on with, with your abilities, um, they're very good uh, benefits to have. Uh, we also do workers' compensation and personal injury. I think those kind of explain themselves a little bit uh, in, uh, themselves and veterans' disability benefits. Um, the word disability, though, can mean many, many different things. Um, in Social Security world, um, Disability depends on your past work history, um, your age, your medical problems, et cetera. Usually it's defined as the inability to do any substantial gainful activity. Um, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a definition which is sometimes hard to meet um, in every case, um, but not as hard as you might think. Um, one of the questions we often get in Social Security cases is what's the difference between Social Security disability benefits and SSI benefits? Um, essentially, the word disability means the same in both contexts, um, whether you can work in any substantial gainful activity. SSI benefits an offshoot of the Social Security program where um, you, it, in the event you're in financial need um, and don't have a work history, um, you can tap into a federal benefit um, which gives you approximately $700, depending on what state you're in, uh, possibly a little more. Whereas the Social Security Disability Program, essentially, same definition, are you disabled, but provides you benefits in, in a way in which you access your earnings into the Social Security system. So they're very fruitful um, uh, programs. Um, so again, disability uh, means the inability to work in any substantial gainful activity. Essentially, the inability to work in any full-time minimum wage job. That's essentially the standard. Um, substantial gainful activity changes every year. I believe this year was 1070 um, gross income for a month. So that's how the government defines what is a job that's fair game in the Social Security world. Um, there are rules for evaluating Social Security benefits, and I think that um, the easiest way to describe this, I, I brought up an example. Um, so if we had a coal miner, um, and that's a very, very difficult job. It's a very heavy job. Um, there are skills in that job, but those skills are limited to the coal mining industry. If that person was, for instance, limited to light duty work, 
and they were 35 years of age, that person would not be disabled. If they were 50 and limited to light duty work, uh, they would still not be disabled. But if they were 55, they would be considered disabled. So you might ask yourself, well, why is that? Well, the government essentially um, has uh, written into the Social Security Act that when you get older, it's much more difficult for you to change careers, to change directions. Um, so they give the benefit to those people that have worked a long time and are over the age of 55. Um, the rules can get quite complex here because there are, there are different scenarios where a 50-year-old person has a better chance of getting benefits or a 55-year-old. However, it's essentially uh, the older you get, the little easier it gets to get benefits. So, um, The word disabled in medical records, we see that a lot. We see providers saying, I think my client's entitled to benefits or I think the person is disabled. And we have some very specific Social Security rulings on point which say that is actually meaningless. Um, so doctors quite often try to help our clients and say the person's disabled. What's really meaningful in a Social Security case or in any of our cases for that matter are specific limitations. And physically, how much can you lift? How far can you walk? Um, can you uh, carry? Can you find finger? Can you gross handle? So very specific physical limitations are kind of what we look for in records. And we help our clients build that. So we tell our clients, you know, when you go to the doctor, you know, do what you need to do to get better, but also make sure you stress what limitations you have and how those limitations affect both your ability to do work functions and your ability to do everyday activities. So again, limitations in the terms of, uh, of physical limitations um, are very important in our cases. Um, some of the cases don't quite fit um, this cookie cutter approach of I can't lift this, I can't do that, um, you know, I can't stand for 20 minutes. You know, those are easy cases uh, for the most part conceptually. But chronic fatigue, for instance, is a very difficult concept because somebody with chronic fatigue can have a very good day where they could function, they could um, have a lot of energy, uh, do a lot of activity, uh, and then the very next day they could have significant chronic fatigue which inhibits most um, you know, basic daily activities. So those are the cases which are challenging um, to us, um, but cases which we like because those are the people that don't fit into your co cookie cutter mold. Um, they're people that find it very difficult to maintain employment. Um, they can work one day, not the next. They may even last three, four weeks. I once represented a man who, at, I think he was 42 years of age, and had gone through 40 different jobs. Um, he had chronic fatigue and a combination of mental health. He, he ne and he was very proud to state that he had never been fired from a job. Um, but his symptoms were, were so severe that he would go into the job, he would try, he would do everything he could, and after about three or four months, the employer would say, I'm sorry, we can't use anymore. And like I said, those are the people that we really like to help because it really makes you feel good in the end when you've, you've done something for somebody like that. You can give them security where they don't have to go to another 40 jobs in their next 20 years. Um, so again, physically, um, Limitations are the key, um, and I'm going to kind of hand it off to Michael unless Vince has any other. I'm not used to people finishing on time, so good work. Uh, so you saw a little bit of the overview. Uh, Michael's now going to try to uh, drill down a little bit more to a more specific level to give you those insights. And as you listen to uh, what we're talking about, uh, please think of questions you may have, and please think of ways in which you can interact in helping us prove our client's case. We put out a, a folder in front of you that contains a format that we've created uh, for asking medical providers to assist us and uh, we find it very effective. I'll have let Michael speak to that. Thanks. When somebody's working life is disturbed by an injury or illness, I always think that that has to be the lowest point uh, that they could be. And if the theme today is restorative medicine, we like to think that we're a part of the prong of restoration 
in terms of restoring their financial sanity. While they're trying their hardest to heal from a physical or psychological condition that has affected them, one of the biggest stressors, as you may, could probably tell us, is, well, I need to work because I need to pay my bills, I have kids, and that stress from not having income is painful, and it leads to more stress. And what we're trying to do when somebody comes to our office is get them a collection or maximize their financial resources so that they can then go and focus on what's most important, that's their mental and physical health. And it's really exciting for me growing up around this business and the reason I got into it and now I get to do it myself, when we get someone approved for a benefit or win a workers' compensation case, the weight that comes off someone's shoulders is palpable. You can see them finally kind of slunk down and say, okay, now I can go to step two. Step one was how the heck am I gonna live without any income? Step two now is, all right, I can start to move forward. And so that's what we try to do with each and ind every individual that comes into our office. From a physical standpoint, disability, whether it's social security disability or veterans disability, is pretty pro forma. There are regulations, there are different physical problems that you have, do they fit into those regulations? Psychological conditions are a bit more broad. They're more amorphous and they're easier for us to work with, to, not depending on any age. You can be 20, you could be 30, you could be 60. And anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, they affect everyone at any age the same way. And so even if I'm limited to light duty because of my back, if I'm 30, I'm out of luck. But if I'm 30, and I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder, or I have post-traumatic stress disorder from serving overseas, that affects me the same way. And so there's really one set of standards that isn't age dependent. And so what we are trying to show is that a psychological condition is not allowing a person to maintain concentration, get their tasks done on time, do they need reminders? Do they need a job coach? Do they need to step away from their workspace because they're overwhelmed? Does stress creep in when they're working with coworkers or the public? Those types of symptoms can take you off of work task eight hours a day, five days a week. Any vocational expert that we go and uh, that we cross-examine in, uh, in a social security case or that we work with in a workers' comp case will all agree. You need to, it doesn't matter what kind of job you have, even if you are a uh, copy, uh, photocopy machine operator, very rote, very, same thing over and over again. You have to be able to stay on that job task 85 to 90 percent of the day or no employer is going to hire you. You have to show up for work every day of the month, but eh, maybe one or two days a month your employer will give you to call off. But if you're calling off more often than that, no employer is going to keep you around. So just, in, just on those items alone, a judge can find that somebody can't do full-time work and grant them the Social Security disability benefits. Likewise, in a veteran's disability case, if somebody's not able to work, if somebody's able to work but they're still having social issues with their family, with dealing with the public, doing those types of things, they can be granted a higher percentage of benefits rather than a lower percentage of benefits. That's what this questionnaire is designed to do. This is one of the questionnaires we use time and time again. And, it, and if you take a look at it, you'll see, okay, I, these are things I can answer. But just as important as answering this questionnaire 
is that when you are treating any of the people that we are trying to represent, having these kind of notes, these kind of statements in your, your actual medical notes is gold. And we have a, we have a, a, a saying, at least, uh, at least in our office, and I, a lot of other lawyers use it. If it's not in the medical notes, it doesn't exist. J any judge will tell you that. Judges love looking through medical notes and finding nothing to support all of the time and effort you just spent on this questionnaire. But if you take the time, and it's not even take the time, actually. If you consciously are thinking, we need to make sure that all of these symptoms are down on paper. That goes a long way to helping that person get that financial security at the end of the day that's eventually gonna get them onto step two and possibly back uh, to some sort of full-time work or even part-time work. You know, I, I like to always have this conversation with my clients both during the process, usually the first day they come to see me, they're extremely nervous. And the reason why is this is most likely the first time in their life they've ever had to come and see a lawyer. White collar workers, a lot of the time they've dealt with a lawyer. They've, they've bought a house. They have uh, financial transactions. They're into real estate. They, they deal with lawyers. But when someone has never seen a lawyer and is now sitting in front of me, they can't work, they're, and they're embarrassed that they can't work. They're very emotionally sensitive. And I usually start off with the line, look, I am well aware that I am the last person in the world that you want to come hang out with. If you come in to see me, you got hurt at work, something happened to you in the, uh, in the service, or you, are now, uh, you now have an ailment that doesn't allow you to work on a day-to-day -day basis. I know where you are. My, my goal is to try to get you into a better place financially so that you can move on to life 2.0. And so I always say that even when I win your case, and I tell them this at the first meeting, even when I win your case, I do not want you thinking, I'm going to collect my disability benefit and just sit at home and rest. Because doing that is not going to get you anywhere. For the person that absolutely cannot go to work on a full-time basis, our clients, they're still allowed to volunteer. They're still allowed to go spend time with their grandchildren. They're still allowed to babysit. Those are the things that we're trying to plant in their mind that even if we win their case, they should be thinking about doing those things after we're done with them so that they're moving down, they're staying healthy, they're staying active, and maybe if they're a little older, that's what they're going to maintain the rest of their life. Maybe if they're a little younger, those steps are going to lead back to a full-time job. So if I could leave you with anything, it's, if it's not in the notes, it doesn't exist. And we gave this to you, but when you have a question legally, it doesn't matter if it's our office, although we really hope it is, you can pick up the phone and call a lawyer. Because when you talk to them, they're going to say, thank you for calling me. I'm happy to work with you on this particular matter. This is, this is how we might be able to collectively help uh, our client or our patient. So don't be afraid to talk, call, pick up the phone for a lawyer. They're, more than, they're actually going to be excited you called because that just made their job easier rather than just walking in with some medical notes. Um, I'm going to just finish on one thing. Brian talked a little bit about this, how a social security disability benefit case is with a federal benefit. If you're an active duty service member and you've been hurt during your active duty service, you either have a disease or you actually have a physical injury, when you get back and out of the service, you can apply for disability benefits through the Veterans Administration. You make that application, they take a look at your records, 85% of the time they deny you. That's when we get involved in that, that particular situation. And what we're doing there is doing a combination of one of two things. One, trying to prove that their PTSD does exist and it's related to their service. Or if they're rated at 
because of a cursory exam that was done at the VA somewhere, then we're trying to get them a little bit higher with your help. So just wanted to give you a little bit of background on what that process was uh, in terms of what we were talking about in veterans' disability today. Uh, other than that, uh, I was going to turn it over to Vince. I think it's your turn again. I meant dad. He always uses the dad word around paycheck time. <laughs> And uh, I want to introduce son number two, who also has a name, Adam Quattrini, who is here with us today. He just got admitted to the bar uh, recently, and so I now have both of my wonderful sons with me. Uh, I'm going to call Brian back for two minutes to talk about long-term disability benefits and how they fit into this picture. <clears throat> So I, I briefly explained at the beginning about long-term disability benefits. So um, and does anybody in here know if you have a long-term disability policy to cover yourself? Some of you do. Some, 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 some of you may have benefits and not even know it. Um, most, I think this, the latest statistics were about 55 to 60 percent of employers carried long-term disability and short-term disability insurance on their employees. Um, these are, again, important benefits because Unlike veterans' benefits or, or workers' comp or personal injury, where you have to prove that a disability was caused by a certain thing, in the context of long-term disability, all you have to prove is that you have a disabling condition and you can't work or perform your job duties because of that disabling condition. Um, about 30% of my practice is dealing with um, insurance companies for our clients who are denied uh, disability claims. Um, there was a law passed in 1974 which actually predates me, but not Vince, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was meant to protect pension plans. Um, back in the 60s, the, the employees at Studebaker Pension, uh, or Studebaker, uh, the automaker, um, didn't get their pensions. It was a, it was, it was a systemic uh, problem in, throughout the country where different states had different laws uh, to protect pension benefits, and these poor men didn't get their pension benefits. I think only 10% of them got maybe 15% of what was owed to them. So Congress got together and, and made a compromise amongst the parties and, and came up with this statute, which is called the Employee Retirement Income and Security Act, which was a system generated very similar to the Social Security system for long-term disability benefits, pension benefits, any employee fringe benefits. And it's a very, very unfair system. Um, it's a system that allows insurance companies to interpret the language of policies, to decide what disability is, to decide uh, if, the, if this medical evidence is enough or not enough. And a court will uphold their decision as long as they're not arbitrary and capricious. Uh, which, you know, arbitrary and capricious, it's, if, if I decided to put a kilt on today and run around the, the streets of Blairsville, that would be an arbitrary and capricious decision. So a lot of our clients are facing an extremely uphill battle against these insurance companies. Um, Cigna, Unum, uh, Lincoln Financial, Hartford, I mean these are all companies that we deal with on a daily basis um, who are very nice to us when we interact with them but in terms of decision making it's just devastating decisions um, and these are benefits which the few of you that raise your hands probably pay for um, or if not that and your employer is paying for them and, and it's part of your salary that you're not actually seeing in your paycheck is going to pay for these benefits. So these are, again, it's a very, very important benefit, um, you know, and it's something that, you know, I'm really passionate about because I could tell you so many horror stories about how people with real disabilities, and I don't want to, you know, say that not everybody has a disability, but with, with, with substantial disabilities, MS, lupus, um, cases that you don't think would ever be denied get denied by these insurance carriers. And what we see a lot, is people walk away from them. They're so frustrated by the way this system has evolved in terms of having to file internal appeals and having to do this and having to gather more medical from their doctors, all in a time when they're trying to get better, that I've had considerable number of people walk away. And that's kind of the business model that these big insurance companies are using. It's delay, 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 uh, frustrate, frustrate, frustrate. If they walk away, that's money in our bank. We don't have to pay that out on the back end. And, and, you know, um, it's just an important benefit. And if you do see anybody with a short-term disability, short-term disability or long-term disability denial, 
Don't let them walk away from that denial. Um, get them to a lawyer. Um, get them to file an appeal. Do something because doing nothing just doesn't change the, the ball game. So. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and that's, that's part of the takeaway today is that when you're interacting uh, to ask those questions of the people in front of you, you know, what benefits do you have in the workplace? Uh, as Brian said, many people don't realize what they have, uh, and then that helps them uh, look to whether they should be getting legal counsel to assist them. Uh, let me stop at this point and ask if you have, we've generated any questions that you have and let you ask them before we go on. Anybody want to put their hand up? Yes, sir. Disability benefits have been around for actually a considerable period of time into the, in, I believe in the, the 60s, I think. Um, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, it was very difficult to get disability benefits under the Social Security Act. Um, if anybody could guess, what was the number one disability prior to 1980? It was heart conditions. Uh, basically, in the 60s, 70s, days, you can get benefits if you had heart conditions. Now it's back conditions. So we've kind of come, come into different disabilities. but. I, the program, um, the SSI program gets funded out of a separate fund than the SSD program. So the SSD program um, is basically essentially the person can tap into their benefits um, early, their early retirement basically, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but I, like I said, the numbers of disability claims, you know, I, I, I can tell you from our perspective, it's been a pretty steady increase. There was a, when the economy did um, shutter, there was, uh, there, was a, there was a fairly large increase of benefits. It's kind of stabilized out since then. Um, but the question is about the funding. We, you know, we go to a conference every year. Um, this year's in, in uh, D.C. Um, the Secretary of the Social Security Administration comes in um, and talks about the funding uh, of the Social Security Trust. And I believe the trust is still in, according to the, our organization, the trust is still in uh, good shape for the dis to pay out disability benefits. So. And, and I'll touch on that just very uh, quickly. Disability benefits, the, disability, the social security system is paid for as we work. As Brian was saying, the SSI side of it is separate and apart. And when compared to the SSD amount size, in terms of budgeting, is much, much, much smaller. I just want to use it at least once. Social Security disability, any of the stories you hear now about the drain on the system or it's underfunded is, is done just by that. It's been underfunded for some period of time. And it's been borrowed against by Congress for some period of time. And third, in, in, with the, the downturn, there was an uptick in applications and approvals. But that uptick in approvals and applications were people in their mid to late 50s, early 60s. And frankly, all they were doing was getting their retirement benefit maybe five or seven years early. So the idea that there was a big grab of disability benefits is really a misnomer. It's really people just retiring a little bit early. Uh, and, and those people that were working, the reason that they were approved for disability once they went off is because they had been working disabled for probably 10 years already, and their employers were nice enough to keep them around, accommodate them, and everything else. But then when it came time to make cuts or close shops, those people were usually the first to go because they were the least efficient. There was nothing mean about it, but that person, had they gone off five years earlier, would have been approved anyway. Anything else? Yes.
Brian will speak to our practice standard. Our practice standard is we get involved very early in cases. Sometimes we're involved a year and a half before the person even leaves work. Uh, we're looking at every different aspect of their life. We're looking at their health insurance. We're looking at uh, retirement. We're looking at IRAs. We're looking at how can we, you know, in the worst case scenario that somebody has to wait 24 months to get a hearing, how do we make sure that they can survive? And that's where our short term and our workers' comp and VA, that's where all of that has really stemmed from over the years is us learning a little piece about somebody. Somebody comes in with a mortgage foreclosure, we then now have to become experts on mortgage foreclosure so we can help them survive. We, we might be able to get them on unemployment, they might meet those regulations. So we like a more open relationship with our providers um, where. Yes. Yes. You're dealing with the typical people. We like to call ourselves special, not atypical. And, and, and just, just to follow up, and, and Real quick. we are atypical, but there is sometimes only the, the social security system moves at its own pace. And there are times we can feed on their door all day long, and it's not going to change anything. But let me just answer the foreclosure question. Real quick. If a person has a foreclosure notice or a utility shutoff notice, not their cable, I'm talking water, gas, or electric. We can send that in a request and expedite it here. So if that's the case, they need to get that thing to their lawyer to ask for that expedited question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to take a, only a few minutes. Is that a question back there? We practice throughout uh, western Pennsylvania. We have colleagues who practice in the other parts of the state so that if you call us, we'll connect you with those colleagues who specialize like we do. And uh, do we make home visits? I think the answer would be yes, but we can reach out by telephone, which we do very frequently with clients who can't travel and solve that problem. So I'm only going to take a few minutes on the concussion, the physical part that also has the emotional and uh, cognitive to me is the physical part of an injury and how that plays into someone's disability. Uh, in the social security world, of course, if you have a concussion, uh, that will be considered by the judge, perhaps as just a physical injury, but it can get you off of those grids that they've been talking about and allow you to be considered differently even though you're under the age of 50. In a workers' comp setting, uh, our judges, of course, are allowed to consider the the consequences of concussive symptoms and how they would affect your ability to go back and do your time of injury job. So the, I'm not going to talk about what the symptoms are of a concussion because many of you would already know all of that. But what we have learned is that that condition, those symptoms are undertreated and often misunderstood by a number of medical providers. Uh, and it takes someone to drill down to understand that those, uh, that fatigue is a classic post-concussive symptom, that the headache, the uh, dizziness, the tinnitus, those all affect your ability to work, right? And, and they get missed a lot of time as individuals go through the system. So we've learned to focus on that and we look for the practitioner who is able to help us develop what you can't see. Broken bones are easy. You know, cancer is easy. 
but a, an individual with a post-concussion syndrome has a lot of things that we can't measure and we can't see. So we've, we look to neurologists, we look to psychologists, we look to neuropsychologists, uh, vocational psychologists. So there's lots of players, medical players in the, in the definition and the approach that we take to develop the case. Uh, and, and what I found over the years that neuropsych testing is perhaps uh, the most effective way for us to convey this invisible problem to a fact finder. And, and so keep that in front of you when you're looking to help develop uh, a case for someone who uh, has a, a concussion cognitive issue. As, as Dr. Chahadri pointed out, I met him because I went to his office to actually size him up, to see whether he was going to be the physician I could count on to understand the legal part to convey the legal part and to be firm in his opinions about what was wrong with my client. I often say to doctors when we're getting ready to take their deposition, if you use the word maybe today instead of yes or probably or could be instead of it is, you will watch me age right in front of you because those words are, in our world, insufficient to prove our burden. And you may mean to say something, but when you start edging over to the probabilities, uh, we lose. And, and meeting someone face to face, especially if they don't have any legal experience, is invaluable, and we're willing to do that at any time that you think uh, that it would enhance proving a disability for our clients. Uh, I'm going to stop at that point. I'd, I'd like to get uh, Dr. Valentine in front of you to talk about, uh, as all of us are talking about building a case to provide a cash stream for our clients, Dr. Valentine is going to talk about the recovery piece that also follows our, our job. Uh, and so Dr. Valentine, he, uh, the catchy phrase for him is that he's a, a bio, a Cairo, and a socio. <laughs> he got his undergraduate biology degree at St. Vincent, his chiropractic degree at Palmer College, and his uh, uh, licensed uh, social work at the University of Pittsburgh. So you might try that someday. Yeah, yeah, bio, bio. <laughs> Good afternoon. We heard a lot about the mechanics of disability from once somebody is in the process of seeking it. I want to open the door briefly. I know we're short on time for this segment, but that human journey, and, and those of you who are clinicians, who are the treaters, who are the supporters, imagine that my first PowerPoint slide was just a big, red square and you pick how deep of a color you want that red to be but that's all you see and behind that red square you're taller than the rest of us thank you and behind that red square is a whole bunch of information so that that potential disability patient client presents to you and what do you think the first thing out of their mouth is to you as a supporter in that red square? What do you think they're saying to you? Hi, I am so-and-so and I'm in pain. And you ask them, well, tell me more about your life. And what do you think they tell you? Well, it's miserable, I hurt, can't do anything. You go, well, how's home life? It sucks. How's work? I can't. What did you eat for breakfast? Pain flakes. You know, they're, they're not engaged with any other element than that red square. 
And as clinicians, if we're not crafty enough, we'll just say, hey, this person hurts a lot. Oh my gosh, we've got to treat this pain. And is pain a diagnosis? Is it really treatable? Yeah, and it is not. It is hard to treat just pain. We need to find the functional reason for pain. So behind that red square is a mystery, but we can't get that red square to clear its, its uh, to become a little bit more see-through. Imagine that I push the button on the power slide and from the middle we get this little blink of whiteness and it starts coming out and it starts to read a word. And that word that we hope to guide patients into is acceptance. That profound step from the suffering into acceptance. Wow, what a huge therapeutic step to sit across the person who accepts where they are on that spectrum of health with broken bones, with permanent conditions, is much different than sitting across the person with a high level of anxiety, with a view of life of complete misery. No therapeutic effect intervention is effective if all we see is red, especially if that's all they see. So our goal as treaters I offer to you, and it's either validating what you already do or suggesting that we ought to break through this, is to begin to look past the red into the beautiful person they are and the capabilities. But how do we know what the capabilities are? We have to measure them. We have to know the quality of their life. Indeed, those questions that we had just heard, how long can you stand, how hard can you grip, how does it affect you? Can you walk upstairs? How long can you hold a thought? We need to begin to quantify what that red square is. And in doing so, we create enough of a picture for us as treaters so that we could begin to make the appropriate referrals, so that we could begin to treat most effectively. And hopefully that, again, is validation. But that information does support that person because disability is, in its definition, something that in the foreseeable future will still be there. It's not going away next year and it's not going away the year after that. And it's tough in our minds to be fixers of people. We want to help, we want to, to do an intake and say, I know that problem, I could help you and we'll be back to normal. Well, in the disability world, that doesn't exist. We don't have that ability at times. So I offer in this brief presentation that we look to be treaters for the people that we serve to help them gain that level of acceptance so that that is that stepping stone to be the healthiest that they could be. Thank you. Any other questions? No more questions. So we're, uh, I'd like to close on behalf of us by uh, acknowledging what you all do every day uh, in the form of a, a quote from a Quaker author, Douglas Steer, which many of you may be aware of. To listen another soul into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. And it's the art of listening, the ability to see beyond what sits in front of you and what comes out of someone's mouth right, and to uh, help them find insight into what it is that pains them and holds them back. And uh, I, again, one time went to meet with a psychologist about my client, and he had this quote on the wall, and I thought it was so appropriate, uh, and something that all of us should strive to do is find 
better ways, more effective ways to listen. Uh, what I enjoy is when I get the male client or vice versa coming in with their female uh, significant other or spouse and I find that while my client is talking to me there's more to be learned by watching the other person's reactions and the rolling of the eyes and the look like what? You're telling him that you can walk two miles? You know, and, and so, and then I just, depending on my rapport level, I just turn to the other person and then really start to extract what I think is happening. And as you may find with many of your patients, clients, uh, that people don't want to admit their failure. They don't want to have to acknowledge what they consider a weakness and they'll puff themselves up, understandably, but that gets nobody anywhere if they're trying to prove what's wrong. And you can find out more from a spouse, a clergyman, a coworker, and others who have interacted with the pre-disability person and the post-disability person to find out what is really it's all about. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to all of my colleagues and uh, enjoy the rest of this wonderful spring weekend.